Week five is the most summary of summaries. We're going to encounter consumer behavior. Now, by way of context, consumer behavior is a full-fledged subject at the ANU. And also in the Australian New Zealand Marketing Academy, it is the largest single research and presentation track. Usually, well, if there's 16 tracks, there's consumer behavior and there's five other tracks that balance up consumer behavior. So there's a lot of work in this area. There is a massive amount of work in consumer behavior. But really, one of the things that CB, why there's so much work in CB, and you'll have to get used to me referring to it as CB because I just habitually do, is that we don't fully understand how humans work. So we know that we undertake marketing activity. And we know that consumers consume products. And periodically we have this moment of going, we think we know what causes A to C, but then correlation doesn't always equal causation and causation itself wanders off doing its own thing on a regular basis. So functionally we have this, the element there which yeah, in the diagram I'm describing as then the magic happens. But it's frequently referred to as the black box, the buyer's mind, all the internal factors that we can't control for in a consumer. So why we study consumer behavior is that at the core of the marketing philosophy is the idea that we create, we communicate, we deliver, and we exchange offerings that have value for a customer. If we understand more about our customers, chances are we can create more things that are valuable or an offering that has greater value or greater opportunity to be valuable. Which is the challenge. And this is one of the things about understanding marketing is the more we know about someone, the creepier it gets at the point of an organization being able to second guess a living, breathing, thinking human through the use of spreadsheets, it's unnerving. But it's also the problem that we face is that we can't always predict the consumer. So we have the, the fundamental three zones that we're looking at here. We have the external factors, the stimuli. We control the marketing mix. You'll see that the pestle makes its run. Then there's the consumer. Now we use a series of broad brush strokes of consumer characteristics to classify and hopefully predict aspects of behavior. We also have a theoretical framework in here, the decision-making process, and that's one of the really rock-solid foundational ways of us thinking about the process of how people go from I need it to I want it to I've bought it. And remember how marketing is a, an activity, which is the stimulus and external factors, and it's a set of processes. When we're describing it as a process, we're describing an idealized state. If you're an economist, we call this, there's a bunch of assumptions and models in there. But basically, we can't perfectly predict, which is good. But we've got the next best, or we've got our current next best thing. So, welcome to a very short guide to what is 12 weeks worth of content. And even then, that's a short guide, summary guide to a wonderfully expansive field of marketing research. Also, spoiler alert, some of the ideas that we talk about here in intro, you will see again in consumer behavior, the subjects that we offer here at the ANU. When you see them again, you'll see them in the context of the consumer behavior subject. So it's not a case of going, oh, learned that in the intro, boring. It's a case of going, right, that's where this fits in. So things you need to know. We know a lot, but one of the facets of our knowledge is that consumers' responses are conditioned by societal influence. 
What makes marketing harder than rocket science is the moon is still where we left it. You can use the same tech from the first moon landing, point roughly in the direction of the big rock up there, and you got good odds of getting to the moon. If you use the right tech, use the old, use their old school 60s tech, because we got there. If you try running an advert from the 1960s and it's not in some form of context of look how weird it was back then, you cactus, you, your brand's gone. You can't change. So when we start talking about things like the, the notion of the creeping professionalism, and this is one of the things in technological development, society has changed, things have changed. So as a discipline, we've learned a lot about the way thoughts are processed, about the way decisions are made, and equally, we've contributed this knowledge back out to a society that has now started to become wise to the ways in which we understand them. The very existence of a TV program such as the Gruen transfer or the Gruen effect or whatever the Gruen they're calling it these days is a show which is basically a marketing tutorial done slightly badly, slightly slowly. But fundamentally, it's teaching people about how marketing works. So as soon as people know how marketing works, they suddenly get better at not being influenced by marketing. So one of the questions we always have, uh, a classic consumer behavior question is, why won't the consumer behave? Why won't someone respond to the stimuli the way we're expecting them to, particularly where they responded to that stimuli in a very similar manner previously. What is it that's made it different this time? On the consumer side, one of the things that's really unnerving is being second-guessed by a spreadsheet. Now there's a lot of that goes on on the internet and I'm gonna say that there's a whole bunch of things, particularly BuzzFeed, looking right at you. The pick 18 different desserts from this, this cart and we'll tell you your age. Being second-guessed by a spreadsheet is unnerving, particularly when it's complicated. At the same time, more data does not equate to more insight. So we're hitting a problem in consumer behavior because the sheer volume of tracking that's being done is bringing us to statistical event horizons. That at a certain point, the data just starts becoming significant because there's just too much of it. The analysis breaks and stops working. And the last thing you need to know about consumer behavior is that it is the most meta-reflective experience you're going to have. You are currently consuming this video and the messages of this video are being processed through your decision-making framework, through your learning framework, through your knowledge framework. That is described in consumer behavior as you're learning about how it's being described in consumer behavior. The only way to make it more meta would be is if you could step three feet back and to the left and be able to look over your own shoulder whilst you were doing this. You get used to it when you've been in consumer behavior research for a while, but along the way there will be points where you'll be like, this is uncomfortable because this is, yeah, I do that, I, that's a thing. So there's a couple of caveats that need to be put up. First and foremost is a lot of the marketing consumer behavior, uh, we have borrowed it from psychology and not always recent psychology. So if you're a psych student looking at this guy, oh, that was discredited 20 years ago. Yeah, it's still working for us. Doesn't work for you, works for us. Secondly, when we, like when people borrow marketing tools and techniques and take them to their discipline, we don't always get all the wires, all the cables and all the connecting parts. So sometimes we mis, misapply, but basically because we're also a functional discipline that needs theories and ideas need to work for them to survive and be ongoing, we're getting good enough return. We do, however, also need to address the fact that a lot of the theoretical foundations of marketing's consumer behavior are based on Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and, well, Democrats are pushing it, but democratic countries. Or also they're based on MBA students at Harvard. Uh, look, early marketing was not big on diversification of the sample. 
in fact, there was the sense that uh, Harvard man, an MBA student from Harvard who was usually upper middle class, white male, mid 40s, and had a career in sales before them, was a universal substitute for any other cultural uh, variable. It's either that they thought these guys were so generically dull and neutral that they were functionally could be replaced by a ham sandwich, or there was a massive amount of um, self-involved privilege of thinking that they, the way that they thought was universal to everyone. So this is why in marketing, when we talk about market segmentation, we also talk about market research and the need to understand the consumer that we have not a cliche or a stereotype or a framework that we built and borrowed 20 years ago. So what we're going to talk about in this video is the decision-making framework here. We're going to step you through each of the elements because these are a couple of key ways to understand how the consumer reacts and what the role of marketing is at the various points along this Think of this as a journey. What are the waypoints? So the first waypoint that we also need to draw your attention to is need recognition and needs trigger link to each other. If the consumer behavior decision process is an iterative, rolling, ongoing, cyclical process, some steps get skipped, some steps get repeated multiple times. The consumer makes up their own mind their way. So let's start on the first step, the need recognition. And this is always, so needs, uh, this idea of there's a difference between the state that you're currently in, your actual state, and a desired future state. The greater the gap, the more likely is that it will create a sense and recognition of there is a problem to be solved. Now there's a whole sequence of ways in which we can get need recognition to take place. There can be straight up the internal uh, biophysical response of the target audience going, yeah, I need something, I want something. If you've ever walked around the shop going, I'm looking for something but I don't know what it is, you're in need state. But needs and wants are also, there's a lot of discussion and definition around this, a need is, tends to be the top level physiological uh, higher order. The want tends to be how it's actualized. So the idea of I'm bored, I need to use my mind for something, I need mental stimulation, I need my brain to be working. How will I resolve that? I'll resolve that through my want. My want is I'm going to play an Xbox. I'm going to play something on the Xbox. The enabler then that I need is I need there to be a game on the Xbox that I want to play. For all of you who have been collecting and downloading games that you fully intend to play later, it counts. It genuinely counts. You have a need. You have a need for future forward planning. You have a want, a thing, a reward, a thing I will do in the distance. The fact that we, if we never get around to doing it, then we met that need and it's done. We, congratulations on your value exchange. Your offering has value to you. But in terms of creating the, the need as well, one of the things to consider here is that the initial need is I need to do something. That can be resolved through a number of different ways. One of the ways is oh, I wouldn't mind playing a video game. To play that video game, I need the game. So therefore, I've triggered another need cycle is I need to select from I either need to buy a new game, download a new game, or select from my existing library. Needs. So we're getting the ability to keep triggering different rounds of needs recognition. So at the start, the first element here is that this is not a clean, nice little set of boxes because humans don't think like that. Cats don't even think like that. What we're looking for is an understanding that in the messiness that is human life, we can basically point back and go, need recognition, that's probably the starting point. Once we've identified, okay, there is a need, we need to solve this problem, 
then you have an internal search and external search. When you step into the exam room at the end of the semester, you are going to use the internal search. It's going to be memory, recall, prior experience, and the synthesis of these elements. Now this is why we are doing the activities and exercises that we do is so we're laying down cues and triggers, creating prior experience so that there are opportunities for recall under pressure in an exam room. External search, we're actually simulating that and you have that problem to solve with your assignment. The reason why we ask you to use a literature review and read journal articles and research is that we are actually in the marketing subject trying to get you to simulate the information search from the decision making process. So you're looking for search based information, you're looking for solutions, you're looking to say what is the problem I need to solve, what are the options I have available. Now as a consumer quite often your information comes from the people around you. There are those moments where you go and just look around you for inspiration. Or you're in a shop, you are not sure about which option, you know, you've got four or five different options to choose from, you look to see if you are peer compliant, which one sold the most, that's clearly popular, I'll get it. If you're peer resistant, which one sold the least, I'll give that a try. There's the marketing messages, those are the communications that we put out. But we also have the new thing, the proxy consumption. Now I mentioned this back in social media is the idea that an unboxing video or a let's play video or watching people engage in the consumption of a product as a proxy consumption becomes information search about that product. You are vicariously trialing a product by watching them. Now it may never be a case that I go out on a four wheel driving, well, it's very very likely I'll never go out four wheel driving, I'm very urban in that sense but I watch the four wheel drive action channel to give me the proxy consumption of driving in interesting and exotic places without actually having to get my tires on my car even remotely dusty. For me, there is a need. The need is curiosity, satisfaction. The need is satisfied even at the proxy consumption. So one of the things to be considering here is that whilst the loops and the steps sometimes each element can just skip straight to consumption. Need recognition, consumption. Information search, the search, the chase becomes um, a reward in its own right, consumption. So this is also a very important contextual piece of information. The decision choice set is one of the most useful things to get your head around as a theoretical framework that governs your university experience. So in everyone's mind there is the universal set. This is the set of absolutely everything you can remember about a given topic. Then there's the retrieval set and this is the set of options that can be thought of and thought about as possible solutions to a problem. Then you have the evoke set, which becomes the short list of possible solutions derived out of the retrieval set that are most likely to be your go-to solutions to the problem. When we are looking at something like the recall of information in an exam room environment, the questions are designed to trigger the evoked set. The retrieval set gives you more choices, but you need to filter out from those choices the most useful responses to be the evoke set. To maximize your ability to do this, we give you a range of different alternative information. We need to make it work and to be in your best benefit and your best opportunity to create value from the subject, we provide you with multiple different channels. A textbook, a video, a tutorial, a lecture, your own reading, and your learning from the assessment tasks. This helps build the universal set. 
the broader your universal set is, the more likely it is that you have a retrieval set that's viable and contextual to your, in, your immediate problem you need to solve. For example, an exam question that says, give an example of, if you've engaged in a bunch of different activities and exercises, chances are you've had, you have some examples at your discretion, at your disposal. The evoke set, the reason we do our practice, our training and our drills, and we get you to do some trial exam questions early in semester, and we get you to do some presentations, we get you to discuss questions, we get you to talk, is that we're creating and rehearsing the evoked set. So that's using, one of the things about this is that you can use the theory of learning and you can use consumer behavior to your advantage to improve your university life. In the commercial marketing set of perspective, the universal set exists by all the brands that you know of. The retrieval set is when you have a problem, and I will say to you now, you need to pick up a couple of cans of drinks. You need to pick a dozen cans of drinks for your mates. You got four or five people coming over, you need to pick up uh, two or three cans of drinks each. You will now be able to start thinking of an evoked set of possible brands, possible things. If I tell you which of your mate, if I give you some more specifics, like you know which mates are coming over, the evoked set will tie into, oh, I know they've got a brand preference. But if I just say, think of soft drinks, think of large bottles of soft drinks, you should be able to recall a number of brands, a number of product options. That becomes retrieval and evoked. What happens in consumer behavior is that once you get to the evoked set, there will be a set of decision processes. Decision rules are a way in which we try to explain the world that is often done at reflex level and really fast. But it all comes out to one, one of a sequence of possible decisions. And I refer to this as the absolute yes. That brand must be there. You walk into the store, if they do not have, and I will tell you now that for me, it's Pepsi Max. I'm needing a caffeinated beverage. I'm not sports drink, a caffeinated beverage. And they say, oh, look, I asked, do you have Pepsi Max? If the answer is no, then the answer is no. It's an absolute yes. It must be this brand and it must, so if it's in stock, I will buy it. If it's not in stock, I will not substitute. The contingent yes is there are other brands where I don't really, I'm not that fussed. The contingent yes is if it's in stock, then that's the one from the Evoke set. If not, the next choice. So you're heading in to Canberra Centre. You've got a choice across the Nando's, the uh, Grilled, or continuing on, and it's like, if there's, a, if there's a queue at the Nando's, then grilled. If no queue, then Nando's. That's a contingent yes. If it's available or it's in stock, then yes. If not, you got fallbacks. The backup yes is what occurs when there is uh, the next best, or you're down several. You're still within your evoke set. You're still within things that are satisfying, you're OK with. Um, but it wasn't your first yes. The maybe is a conditional purchase of I need it, I'm willing to live with it, I'm willing to trade off to, because there is enough value, I will trade my way down to, I'll trade my expectations out. And the final one is the straight up absolute no. It's like, decision, you've gone through everything, and gone, not, not buying. In the decision, we also then run into a bunch of barriers to the decision. And that is, yes, I wish to purchase. If yes, then is it available? So that's a question. Did the distribution channel put the product at the point the consumer is wanting to purchase it? An out of stock error here means that you have to go to one of your, your next best choices. Is it affordable? You've gone, yep, absolutely want to, you know, you want to buy you look at it, you want to buy a new game, you walk in, you look at the prices and go, oh, no, I don't have the money for it this week. So, yes, that's your choice, but it's not in the price parameter. There's also the product parameter of, is it in the right size? And we've all experienced this where 
do you have this in an Excel? Do you have this in a 2XL? Uh, do you have it in the right... It's all the features you want, except is it the right capacity? So there are still, at the last moment, barriers to purchase that can trigger an immediate, well, I'll just go to the next item in, the, in my internal queue of possible ways of solving my problem. There's also the can you find it, and this is a big one. When the stores change their layouts because they're doing, they know that we're all, we're creatures of habit, we're on low involvement, and low involvement means that you're not using a lot of thinking, you're not using a lot of processing, you're defaulting to habits, you're staying on purchases that you're familiar with. When the store layout changes, that forces you to pay attention, so it increases your processing, increases your level of involvement, and it's more likely for you to start reconsidering alternatives and reevaluating alternatives. It's also quite likely if there is a multiple if the store changes too frequently, for you to decide this isn't worth going to anymore. I liked it when it was three layouts ago. Similarly, you'll find that there is a lot of work that's done in retailing, we we'll talk a bit about that later, that helps alternatives emerge at the point of purchase. Now, purchase is, under the old school, under the old regime of marketing, that was our job done. As soon as the product was purchased, we were out. It's like, thank you, good night. Consumption is now an issue for marketing. Because we are talking about the concept of offerings that have value, and we're talking about concepts such as co-creation, we need to play a greater role in ensuring that the value that the customer is seeking can be unlocked by their consumption of that product. There's a whole series of questions on the screen here that basically comes down to can the customer get the value that you're promising from the product that you're offering? And I'm going to take something really basic, and that is food. Cooking, home cooking. Do you have the skills to cook at home? Do you have the equipment? Do you have an available kitchen? When someone provides a recipe that recalls for five different kitchen appliances, do you have access to them or substitutes? Do you need a question? So you go out, you buy yourself a uh, roast, you buy some roast potatoes for the roasting. Okay, I need a roasting pan. Okay, I'll need oil to go in that pan. I also need spices to go on the potatoes. Get everything home, look out and go, ah, I also need an oven to go with it. Now, sure, you're going to know whether you have an oven or not. But... When you start breaking down a product to what are the assumptions around the factors needed to maximize the value? What else do you have or you need? And we see this quite often uh, when we start looking at the additional equipment required to maximize the value, particularly when we start going into the do it yourself. It needs a skill set, but it also needs available sequences of tools, of equipment of hardware, of software, all of these become increased challenges up the difficulty level and maybe up the value and the feature, like finally you're getting used for that lemon zester you've had, which you've never understood why you needed the zest of a lemon, but you have the little thing that does the zesting. And now you're baking that cake that needs the lemon zest, you and a lemon that you're about to scrape some of the skin off, good to go. So consumption becomes a, there's a lot of work around consumption, but for us as marketers, some of these questions about the role of value in consumption. But I also just want to briefly raise the pestle elements. And this came out um, the total fire ban days in Australia that said you cannot engage in welding, soldering, grinding, gas cutting, outdoors on a total fire ban day. That's an environmental and legal barrier to the use and consumption of a product. It's not a barrier I was thinking of when I was thinking of what can Bunnings sell to the world, but there are barriers that we need to be aware of. What are the consumption barriers that the consumer is going to face based on the pestle?
elements. Post-purchase. All right. So consumption and post-purchase are two separate factors. Purchase and consumption can be considered the same outcome, or they can be considered two different outcomes. Because you can buy products for others, and you can buy uh, for yourself, you may be the customer, you may be the client. But for us, the post-purchase decision-making that we're interested in here are the three possible outcomes, positive, ambivalent, and negative. Positive and purchase. Satisfaction, you're happy with the purchase. There's one box, extra box here I just want to raise is it solves the problem. Problem's done. You don't need to purchase ever again. Purchase satisfied, done. Cheers, mate. Job done. So there will be no second purchase. There can be satisfaction uh, and satisficing. Satisfaction is not necessarily 100%, but good enough. You'll retry it, you'll give it another go. It's one of those things of, yeah, I'll get better at that. Or I'd like to see the movie again. Uh, this time I'm going to pay attention to the background characters. Purchase again, I had so much fun, I'm doing it twice, or that solved the problem. That was a useful product, I'm going to buy it again. And then there's loyalty. This is above purchase again, this is purchase again because continuing to consume this product and this brand and being connected to it is valuable to me. On the mid card, the ambivalence. Cognitive dissonance is an important mental process. It's where you are having to resolve a difference in your head between what you expected and what the reality is, that there is a certain level of, I need to think about this, my satisfaction's not there. Now, if you try it again and it solves and it becomes satisfying, on the back of a cognitive dissonance, you can also become, increase, become more passionate, more powerfully connected to the brand than if it was just satisfaction first time. Because you've used higher involvement levels, because you've done a lot more thinking. The flip side is that if you're in cognitive dissonance and you decide against, you have a much stronger resistance and rejection of the product. So if you go in, you're like, I'm really not sure about that, I'm not sure about that. Think about it, think about it, no, I really didn't like it. You're very much in the didn't like it. And the third option is dissatisfaction. You can see dissatisfaction loop back into retry and trial again, but functionally for us, for here, it's I didn't like it, not doing it again. So it's buy it, liked it, do it again. Buy it, not sure, thought about it. Buy it, didn't like it, not doing it again. And so we're sort of broadly breaking down the post-purchase environment. Now, the disclaimer is that in consumer behavior, I've written a full text in this. I've taught it a number of times in my career. There's a bunch of things I really like, and I just want to introduce you to some of my favorites. Search determinants, the locus of control. Now, locus of control, again, is another great theory for understanding yourself. The idea of an internal locus of control says that you are in control of your destiny. You are in control in command. An externally focused locus of control says what will happen will happen. That the master of your fates, the fates are master of you. It's a spectrum. It's not a you're either internal or you're external. You're a moving point between these two elements. But if you are a believer in the external control and the world how the world impacts on you will determine a variety of things. That's going, what happens will happen, means that you might be a little less risk prone in certain aspects or a little more risk prone of, well, the gods will handle, the gods will handle this for me. I don't need to take any safety or precautions because you know if it's gonna happen, it'll happen. The second area of interest is the idea of the risk perception. Disclaimer, I did my honours thesis in risk perception. I really love this area. So the first thing to understand about risk is risk can be a cost for the acquisition of a product. 
Risk can also be the benefit of the product. If something is dangerous, it can, it's like, that's a risk. A physical, I'm going to have a physical risk of harm by using this product. Okay, that doesn't seem like a good idea. Then we say, well, the physical risk of harm is bruising, muscle strain, injury, um, dislocated shoulders, broken legs, sounding pretty rough. And then we tell you it's football. There's a risk of injury during playing football. The reward of playing football is greater than your perceived risk. Costs and benefits, risk. So there are five types of risk. Functional risk, the product may not work. Financial risk, it may cost you a lot more than you're expecting. It may result in you having to spend more or there being financial implications. C, gambling. High risk, but perceived high reward. Social risk, there may be risks to your pride, to your reputation, to your standing in the community. But at the same time, that might be the feature that you're seeking. So it might be the people who go, oh look, I'm not gonna, I don't wanna have anything to do with the product that's gonna make me potentially not popular. And there'll be other people going, the lack of popularity is a selling point, I like this, I want the thing that makes me look edgy and you know, risk taking. Physical risk, we've mentioned it, most products have some form of physical risk. Uh, alcohol is, Fabulous for the idea that we will intentionally, as a species, gently poison ourselves. But then we also get back to chili and spice, and we look at the fact that there are physical... People sell chili sauces that are more dangerous to consume than pepper sprays that are used for self-defense. And we sell these things as food. So the physical harm, the, the biophysical feedback loop caused by inflicting significant amounts of pain on ourselves through poisonous chemicals, aka the Reaper Carolina Reaper Chili, that's a physical risk, which is also a physical, which is seen as a reward. And there's psychological risks. There are pri risks to pride, there's, ris there's embarrassment, there's frustration of I couldn't get the value out of the thing. I couldn't, you, know, you have those moments where you're like, anyone who's ever played Dark Souls and gone, why? Ah, oh. anyone who's watched someone else play Dark Souls and gone, yeah, why? The internal psychological danger zone that, but then again, people watch horror movies. There's an entire genre of depressing films. People, watch TV series that will make them cry, that will put them, that will give them nightmares. Psychological risk is a feature that you can sell. So all forms of risk are costs, benefits, and features. It's up to you to understand your audience well enough to know how to embed them. The next idea, concept framework, that's really super useful here is the situational factors. These apply to you and they always apply to you. There's the temporary state. It's the idea of who we are at a given point in time. Who you are now watching this video versus who you are in the classroom versus who you are on the way to the classroom versus who you are at work. You play different roles in different contexts so you'll have different needs, different needs triggers, different roles you can play and also a certain level of pricing will change. What's risky amongst your friends and safe at work in terms of who you are there versus who you are with your mates? We also have the purchase situation, the context of why is it that we are, why has the need been triggered? What are we consuming for, ourselves or another? The psychological factors in this are. Look, the Maslow's hierarchy of needs exists. It's got flaws, but I won't rant about it now, but there'll be other times. But also in the psychological factors, we have a couple of really interesting ideas here. Uh, things around our attitudes, around learning, how we change our thought processes, how we express ourselves as a 
whole, through lifestyle, and how all these facets, all these elements, really tie back into good variables to use for market segmentation. And now, one of my pet theoretical framework areas as well is, this is actually five elements of my thesis, my PhD thesis. I studied innovation adoption theory, and the elements here are the idea of innovativeness. Now, the notion of innovativeness is not universal. It's domain specific. There are the degrees to which you can pick up a new idea and adopt it into your lifestyle. And this is a sliding scale between driven by innovation, you need novel things, and that's novelty seeking, to aversion to innovation. You prefer as it was, as it always will be. Amongst these, you have a couple of other key ideas. And this is, one of them is the attention to social comparison information. And this is the degree to which you are looking to the visible social cues of the people around you in order to decide what you're going to do. In a tutorial environment where we gather a group of strangers whose sole common factor is they're in this subject and they like that time slot, you're looking, if you are high in attention to social comparison information, you're going to withhold your behavior until you have a chance to assess what are the behavior types of the people around you and how you think they're going to respond to the behavior you had in mind. The more you internally filter that, the more you base your decision to act or you self-censor yourself based on what you think other people might think, the higher you are in the normative pressure stakes. Inside a tutorial environment, if you are looking around thinking, I want to answer the question, but what if, what if, what if I'm wrong? Will people think less of me if I'm wrong? You're running attention to social comparison information. If you go to answer a question, you look around the place and go, oh yeah, but what if, what if I embarrass myself in front of them? They, oh no, they'll, they'll hate me forever if I say that. I'm not saying anything normative outcomes. Similarly, if you're looking around a room and going, well, everyone's dressed in blue, good thing I'm in green, you are still using social comparison information. You're just using it in a different way. You're driv the higher need you have for individuality, the higher you need to be in the attention to social comparison information in order to be individual. You need to be very conversant with the information of the social cues around you in order to not comply to them. Bellion takes effort. So these facets are internal thought processes. They're part of the black box. They are things that I found particularly useful when we're coming to deal with learning and learning things. The more you can cope with innovation, the easier it is for you to pick up new ideas. You're if you're studying a subject area you've never studied before, you're just getting hit with innovations week in, week out, and normally four times a week each class is providing you some new, new thing. So you've got to be able to deal with that. Now, consumer behavior, this is the fast recap, this is the fast summary of a subject area with a massive domain of work, a full dedicated subject to it in the marketing major, and we're going to spend a very brief period of time. But what we want you to take out, one of the key things we want you to take out is Elements of consumer behavior theory can be used as a platform to create your decision-making frameworks and your analysis frameworks for segmentation, targeting, and positioning. The knowledge you gain here in this chapter can be used to understand yourself as a consumer and to understand the processes of the people you're targeting as a marketer. So it's worth embracing and embedding this knowledge a whole lot of it describes the processes you're going through in the study of this subject and the other subjects you're doing this semester. And there's a lot of stuff that if you look at it and say, hang on, I could apply this. I could learn this about myself. I could know myself better and use that knowledge to work to a strength, find out where my strengths are. If you are novelty seeking and innovation prone, then you make a good reviewer. If you are needing social comparison information before you purchase, you are a good follower 
but you're also going to absolutely love fashion. Fashion is going to be great for you because there's a pattern you can recognize and work with. All of them become strengths. It's all context. And that's the key thing about consumer behavior is understanding and learning those contexts.